would you be free from the burden of sin? There's power in the blood, power in the blood. Would you or evil a victory win? There's wonderful power in the blood. Yes, there is power. Your king, there's power in the blood, power in the blood. Would you live daily his praises to sing? There's wonderful power in the blood. There is power, power, wonder working power in the blood of the Lamb. There is power. Well, something special. We had a little synopsis Wednesday night of the trip to Israel of our two of our men here at the church. And uh, so I really felt impressed that they should just take the service tonight and just uh, share with us their experiences. And they'll be showing film and they'll be telling about places they've been and and uh, the biblical application to all the places. And so it's just really exciting. I'm, and uh, I, uh, Brother Mike, we're going to see some things. We've already been there before. And every time we, that we see one of those, we stand up and say, praise the Lord. <laughs> all right. Brother Joe, you and your friend, come on down. And y'all take over. Ricky Ferguson, he did last Wednesday night. <laughs> I think they're still friends. They just spent two weeks together. I sure hope they didn't part company over there. I just want to, first of all, I want to talk about blessings, my blessings. Uh, just this year alone, I've been able to see my grandson get saved, baptized, and I've seen my oldest son. He's uh, already been saved, but he's never been baptized. He'll be uh, following believer's baptism here shortly, and I've got a I got a very good feeling about, I think we're going to have another member joining the church here very, very soon. And uh, the, Lord, the Lord has really been blessing me. He's been, he's been really good to me. And I just want to give him all the praise and honor and glory that he so justly deserves. And uh, other than those, he, he also blessed me with the opportunity to go, me and Brother Joe, to go to Israel, which is a blessing because I realize that uh, everybody doesn't have that opportunity. And, uh, and all I can do tonight to the best of my ability is just to tell you some of the things that I've seen and experienced myself. And uh, 
can't help but think about Brother Melvin every time you speak of Israel and Brother Mike you can see that smile come on their face from ear to ear and the gleam in their eyes because uh, it is it's a very very special place and I know it, it meant a lot to me and uh, uh, I'd like to say that uh, it is an amazing place it's a very diverse diverse uh, place for a bunch of different type of people there but, uh, the topography of the land you can start off at the sea 45 minutes later you'll be out in the middle of the desert just a few minutes later and you'll be up in the mountains and uh, most people think of uh, Israel as just nothing but rocks which is take my word for it there's no shortage of rocks in Israel <laughs> but uh, up in the mountains it's just very beautiful and even down in the valleys uh, they've got the farming thing down pat over there they do the irrigation with the drip irrigation on their crops and everywhere you look is uh, all types of uh, food being grown uh, while we were over there they were picking watermelons and you couldn't even see the other end of those watermelon fields and they had done picked them and laid them out in the middle of the rows you know, waiting to be picked up with a wagon and they was just just all kinds of watermelons over there and uh, as for the uh, the food everybody asked me why I was the food it was different but it was good uh, some of us put on a little bit more weight than others I think <laughs> and the, the accommodations over there were top notch they rival anything that we have here in the states the people were very very nice to us very friendly uh, the tour guide we had was extremely uh, informative. She had 29 years of experience in, in what she was doing. And she knew, uh, I would say a little bit about everything, but she knew a lot about a lot of stuff. And uh, that made it, made it so much better for us uh, to be able to learn. I'm just going to, uh, the, t uh, the temperatures over there, they, they were about like they are here, with it being springtime. Only the first day we were over there, that Monday it was 110 degrees, and it was it was really hot that day in Tel Aviv. But the rest of the time it was about like it is over here in the mid to upper 90s. And uh, I'll tell you a little bit about that, about our trip. Now on the first day we left from here at 10:30 uh, in the morning from Atlanta, and we got over to Ben Gurion Airport at 10:05. Uh, the next day which there is a seven hour difference they're seven hours ahead of our time over here so we were in the air for quite some time and uh we flew into tel aviv over there which is uh tel aviv is is a modern city it's just about like you see something here in the states with the exception that uh they're big on electric bicycles over there because the price of gasoline is so very high and uh it's nothing if they get in a traffic jam to see a bicycle or a car as far as that goes, get up on the sidewalk and uh, go down the sidewalk. And, uh, and a lot of blowing horns. <laughs> they, they do believe in blowing their horns. <clears throat> on that uh, Monday, we, like I say, we got there on Sunday. That Monday, we left uh, Tel Aviv at our motel, uh, going to the Sea of uh, Galilee. We drove... Uh, down the coast of the Mediterranean Sea, and we visited the valley of uh, Armageddon. And standing up there looking out across that valley, I can't help what the Bible, think about what the Bible says about in that final battle. There'll be uh, blood up to the horses' bridles. And, uh, you know, you think about that being just, you know, just a valley, but to look from one side of that, that valley to the other, the mountains are on the far side, and you can barely see the mountains on the far side. And that, that, just, that just blew my mind to think about how much blood it would take if that was a literal translation of the Bible, how much blood it would take to fill that valley up. And uh, then we, uh, we left from there. We went to the, uh, to the uh, boyhood town of where Jesus grew up in the town of Nazareth. And that, that was uh, special. I've always been a history buff. And around here, we think of things back, you know, 100, 200 years being history. But over there, you see things 2,000 years old. And that's, that's amazing. And uh, then when we left Nazareth, we went to, the, uh, to Tiberias, to the Sea of Galilee, where we spent the night. And the next morning, we got up and uh, we sailed on the, on the Sea of Galilee. And uh, Brother Joe got to do a little preaching out there on the boat. On
on the Sea of Galilee that morning. That, that was special. And uh, at the end where we docked at, our guide was telling us uh, another interesting fact. The Dead Sea and the Sea of Galilee are not actually seas. They're, uh, they're just large bodies of water. And uh, I don't know the reason. I guess it was just because they're so large that they called them seas. But when we got off the boat uh, on the Sea of Galilee, we went in this museum, and she had already, our guide had told us about the water, how they had been in a drought over there, and how far it had receded from the shoreline. And they had actually found a 2,000-year-old uh, uh, fisher boat, fisherman's boat over there. They had it inside. She went through all the details of how they had uh, brought it up without it just, uh, you know, tearing all to pieces. That was interesting to see something that old and that well preserved uh, from, from back then. <coughs> And uh, from there, we went to the, uh, let's see, that was the fourth day we were over there. We went to the Jordan River. And uh, Joe did some re uh, rebaptismal services there in the Jordan River. That was, I, didn't, I didn't get in the water. I had my insulin pumping all on. I didn't care for that. But I did, we did go to the head of where there's three rivers, there's three streams that start the Jordan River that make it up. I did, we did drink a bottle of water out of the Jordan River. And it was just as cold and as pure. Is any bottle of water you've ever you've ever bought? I mean, there was no contaminants whatsoever, and it was good. And uh, the next day was the fifth day. We went to uh, Masada. That was, that was a special place too. Uh, Herod the Great built it in the first century B.C. And uh, for him to build a city that high, it was a plateau on top of a mountain. And for him to build for those for them to build a city. That long ago, without any modern equipment, uh, it was just mind-boggling. Uh, and they was telling about how the Romans built a ramp up to where they could. They were going to try to invade the city, and they were going to use a battering ram to, to knock the doors down. But when they got up there, the wind turned on them, and it burnt the, uh, burnt the soldiers and the battering ram up. But uh, in this day and time, even with the modern equipment we got, it would take years to build a ramp up, I would think as high as that place was standing. And to think that they done it with uh, just their hands and a few little tools that they had is just, just amazing. They were definitely a, a working people. Of course, most of them, like, you know, were slaves. They didn't have any choice. And uh, let's see, the, uh, from Masada, we left there and went to uh, Qumran. Qumran, that's where the Dead Sea Scrolls were found. And uh, back in 19, uh, 1947, now, the fifth day was a very busy day. We left from there and went to Jerusalem and visited the Mount of Olives uh, in remembrance of the, of the Lord's ascension. That was, a, that was a beautiful place up there. Like I said, it's springtime. We, I think we went, in, went at the right time. All the flowers, you just would not believe how pretty the gardens and all were over there. And uh, then we, uh, we walked the uh, Palm Sunday Road uh, to the Garden of Gethsemane. Again, it was, it was beautiful. And uh, on the sixth day, we made it to the uh, old city of Jerusalem, uh, and we entered in through what is called uh, the Dung Gate. And that was, uh, that was where we went to the Western Wall. And uh, at the Western Wall, I, I actually got to, it was not that, really not that crowded the days we were over there. It was a bunch of folks, don't get me wrong, but it was where we could actually walk up to the, uh, to the the Western Wall and put our hands on it, and we got a chance to pray there, and that, that was special. Uh, and I don't know all the ins and outs of it, but uh, they had it d divided to where uh, the women had to go on one side and the men on the other, and the men and women couldn't go up to the, to the wall together to pray. And then uh, when we left there, we went to uh, Bethlehem and uh, the Church of the Nativity in the Shepherd's Field. On the seventh day, we again uh, went to the old city of Jerusalem, but with this time we ended in through the Lion's Gate. And we walked, uh, which was special to me, we all walked uh, the Via Della Rosa. That's where Jesus walked from the uh, prison to the crucifixion. That was, uh, to me, that that was a highlight, one of the highlights of the trip. And, some of, a lot of people, folks ask me, well, what was the best part of the trip? All of it. 
every single day, every minute. It was all very, very special. And on our, on our way, as we walked to Via Della Rosa, we went to by the Judgment Hall of Pilate and uh, King David's tomb in the upper room uh, on Mount Zion. And uh, finally, we wound up at the Garden Tomb. That was probably, to me, the pinnacle of, of the trip, was to be able to see the tomb, not only see it, but to walk in and see where they laid our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ's body before his resurrection. And uh, on the last day, we had a free day. Me and Brother Joe, we were in church last Sunday. We was just a little ways away. We went to a Jerusalem Baptist Church, and the pastor there was telling us, uh, I think he said it was, what, a half of 1% was actually Christians in Israel. And uh, he told us how the church over there that was probably about three or four block walk from our motel, he told us how the church had been vandalized. They painted all over it and all. And then again, uh, he told us how they had set the church on fire and tried to burn it down. This is right in Jerusalem. And uh, you can see where they, the ch pews, the chairs that they had. And what's the color of ours here? But you could tell where the chairs had been charred from the fire. But uh, they, were still, they were still preaching the gospel. And uh, the message he uh, preached that morning was on praying, preaching, and partying. Uh, the book of Nehemiah. And uh, it was talking about the, uh, the uh, potent prayer, the preaching power. And uh, in Nehemiah 8, where it says weeping in joy, that was the parting time. And uh, there was a group there from uh, Holland, I believe it was. And uh, that little church was uh, probably about the fourth of the size of this one, maybe. And it was packed out. And that, well, that was a real blessing right there. And I want to, as I wrap my little portion up, I want to, Thank all y'all for the prayers for our safety. At no time did we ever feel like our safety was in jeopardy. As a matter of fact, uh, on the streets over there, we were out walking around 11, 12 o'clock at night, and I wouldn't even try that in Atlanta. <clears throat> and, uh, but uh, it was an amazing experience. It's one I know I'll never forget. And I am, I am very, very thankful for the opportunity that I had uh, to go over. Thankful to you, Brother Joe, for take me up on that offer room in that general conversation we had that night it was a it was a really good time but uh it's really good to be back home thank y'all Well, Brother Ricky said everything I was going to say, so let's have a closing prayer <laughs> and go to the house. We, uh, <clears throat> my part of the thing, I'm, I'm going to just take you down a little quick tour down the Jordan River. But more of mine was more than just historical sites. I got some feelings. Uh, I've, I've told you all before, I think I told the Wednesday night crowd this. I got some real problems with emotions. Uh, they just don't work like they ought to. Uh, I, I'm a happy guy, and sometimes I, on the inside I feel like, well, that was touching. But as far as a tear and that kind of thing, it just doesn't work for me. But it worked over there. I'll tell you what, there was some times that uh, I, I couldn't speak. I couldn't take deep breath. It was just it was absolutely astounding to be uh, in the same place in the same community, in the same land where Jesus walked. Uh, I'm, I'm thrilled. I'm glad to be back. Uh, I'm not moving over there. Of course, nobody could afford to move over there anyway. They told us that the average starting house is at 800000 and uh, they require a 35% down payment. There's none of this 100% financing kind of thing, and uh, just absolutely unbelievable. And uh, some of the little houses that we saw, uh, they weren't $800,000 territory, as far as I'm concerned. And they said, <clears throat> you, you can't afford to, to build new houses. So if uh, little Johnny went out and got married, they've just put another layer on the house, another floor. And when Johnny's kids grew up, they had another floor. And so we found some of them over there four or five stories high. And each story is completely different. This one be stone. This one look like it's brick or something. It just, every, you could tell. 
it was different construction. But uh, we had a good time, just absolutely had a good time. I can't tell you how many times that one of us said to the other, can you believe we're really here? You know, and, and we're, just, we're just awestruck by the fact that we were in the land where Jesus walked. And what I want to do, I want to set up, set the stage for you, and then we'll get Brother William to, to hit the go button on this. Where'd William go? Whew. I thought I was going to have to do it myself. I was in trouble. Here's, I'm going to set the stage for you. We were driving, like he said, I, I don't remember exactly which day, third or fourth day. We're coming up highway number 90, the main road. And our tour guide says, when we top this kind of next hill up here, we're going to be in Jerusalem. We're, you're, you'll see Jerusalem. And all of us, that's all we've been talking about. Oh, I can't wait to get to Jerusalem. This is going to be great. You know, oh boy, oh boy. And uh, as we started ascending that hill, the tour guide said, <clears throat> we for years tried to get the right music. And I'm sure every tour guide bus has done that. Y'all listen to the same music I did. And all of them now, I'm sure, play this same thing. But it's a, it's a song by a guy named John Starnes. I'd never heard of him. But they said, <clears throat> here comes your music. This, this will give you the feeling for Jerusalem. And by the time we got to the top of the hill, and this guy's hitting some note so far out there you can't believe it, uh, and we saw that gold dome and, and the skyline of Jerusalem, it was another one of those times where you don't talk. You, you just sit there in awe. And we'll get Brother William to come turn this thing on. And uh, <clears throat> this, is, this is that song, and I just want you to try, if you possibly can, just try to imagine seeing Jerusalem with your own eyes to the tune of this guy singing in your ears. And uh, we started off, I, I got four or five, my technical director is my daughter, and uh, she, did, she did this thing for me kind of hastily. We got four or five American kind of things that they did, I'm sure just for us. They did this stuff, and we see some American things, and then it'll go into the, uh, into the site. The sites aren't in order. We didn't have time for all that. There's no headings and that kind of thing. There's a few that you'll be able to say, well, I know what this is because it says stuff like the tomb, and, and you'll be able to know where you are. But other than that, it's just almost random pictures of the Holy Land set to the music of Jerusalem by John Starnes. If you'll hit it. One night while I was sleeping, I had a dream so fair. I stood in old Jerusalem beside the temple there. I heard the children sing. And ever as they sang I thought the voice of angels From heaven in answer rang I thought the voice of streets no longer rang as with the glad hosannas that the little 
children sang. The sun grew dark with mystery, and the morn was cold and chill as the shadow of a cross arose upon a lonely hill. As the shadow. On its streets and the gates, they were open wide. That old might enter, and no one was denied. No need of moon for the stars by night. For the sun to shine by day, for it was the new Jerusalem that would not pass away. Melvin said it would have been better if I was stand up here telling you about it, each one of those pictures. I couldn't tell you about every one of the pictures, but I can tell you about that one, okay? Uh, <clears throat> we had such a tremendous time. Let me just tell you a couple little things that were, uh, I don't know, out of the ordinary or whatever. There was a couple things that were sort of semi-funny. You saw a picture there of a guy that was on a boat, and he was throwing the net. That's just the way they did it back in the day. And, of course, he wasn't trying to catch any fish. He threw that thing out there, and he hauled it back up, and he said, Oh, we catch nothing. I try other side. Maybe we get 153 fish. <laughs> Cute. Uh, we had a guide, and in just a minute I'll get to, to this, but let me go ahead and tell this while I've caught it here. <clears throat> we had to change guides when we went into Bethlehem because Bethlehem is on the Jordan side, and they don't allow Jewish guides to come over there. Jews can't go into Palace, into Jordan and work. And so we had to change guides, and we got a Jordanian guy that, that guided us through that part of the tour. And when we got in there, he's in the bus, and he's talking in a little, little worse English than our guide had. But uh, <clears throat> we got in there, and he took us on some little jaunt, 
And we're coming back to the bus, and he said, and got us on the bus, and he said, now what we're going to do, we're going to go to the, and he said, you remember where we were, where we saw the KFC sign? And I had seen the KFC sign, but I didn't make anything of it. He said, KFC, over here, it is Kentucky Fried Camel. <clears throat> he let us laugh just a minute, but then he says, oh, but never mind, tastes just like chicken. <laughs> so, there was, there was a, a few little cute things like that that happened, but most everything there, it was just the kind of stuff that you'd say, I can't believe I'm really here. That over and over again, we made that very statement. I cannot believe that I, we, Georgia boys, country boys, here we are in the land of our Lord, uh, watching and looking and walking where he walked. There was one, I don't know if you remember, but on this thing here, there was a picture of my feet. <clears throat> that was the, the, the stairway from the judgment hall where Jesus would have walked down those stairs and taken a left and gone this way out to the, uh, to the uh, what do you call it, uh, Gethsemane. And they had blocked off most of it, but there was the top, about three steps, was left open. And our guide said, you want to walk where Jesus walked? This is the place. And I jumped on that thing and said, click, and got a picture of my feet on steps where Jesus had put his feet just hours before he went to the cross. That kind of stuff will fill you up really, really quick. What I'm going to try to do, I'm going to try to take you to the northern end of Israel, and we'll make a whirlwind, whirlwind tour all the way to the south end of Jerusalem. Ricky's given me 15 minutes okay, to pack in a week's worth of travel down the Jordan River. I'm going to do my best. Okay? Here's what we're going to do. You have to imagine with me now that this is the map. That's Israel. Okay? Here's Israel. Up at the very top in the north end is Mount Hermon. Mount Hermon is the highest mountain in, in Israel. And it's where the Mount of Transfiguration is. It's where Jesus was transfigured. And we didn't get to go up the mountain. We got to the foot of the mountain where the Jordan River begins. But standing here, looking at this little spring of water, if you look up, that's the Mount Hermon where Jesus was transfigured before his disciples. What a thrill to even be in the neighborhood, to be able to look up that hill and say, that's where it happened. Let me tell you about that little spring. Brother Ricky mentioned it. There's three different springs, three different little bitty tributaries that kind of combine to make the Jordan River. And I had the privilege of climbing down the edge down there. There's a little pool. The spring comes out of the side of the mountain, and there's a little pool here. And they said, you can be careful, but go down. And down on my knee on some rock down there got us two plastic bottles filled up with water out of the Jordan River. The guide said, you can drink it here. When we get down to baptizing, don't you drink it down there. Okay? About like the Chattahoochee. But, uh, <clears throat> but it was a blessing and a half to feel that water ice cold coming from the top of Mount Hermon where there's snow most of the time. And here it comes cold and out of that little spring and my plastic bottle. And I didn't mind. I held it up to see if there's anything in it. Just as pure as crystal and cold and sweet to the taste. Tasted about a thousand times better than any other water you've ever tasted because it was out of the Jordan River, okay, in the Holy Land. Fantastic. All right, let's, let's do that. I've got a couple notes here. The first mention of the Jordan River is in Genesis 13. Genesis 13, Abraham says to his nephew Lot, our boys are fighting. We've got some shepherd business going on, and we're having trouble uh, settling some issues. Not enough water, not enough grass. He said, Lot, you choose which side you want. You just pick the spot, and I'll take what's left over. I'll go somewhere else. Lester Roloff used to say that Lot chose grass. And Abraham says, that's fine, I'll take grace. Okay, And God blessed him, even though his was the poorer side of, of, of the pasture land, God blessed Abraham mightily. That's the first, uh, first mention of the Jordan. The Bible says that Lot 
set his eyes on the plains of Jordan. And, and he said, it was a blessing back then. You know what I, this in, I don't have this in my notes, but it just kind of popped in. Let me, let me say it while I'm thinking about it. One of the things that has, uh, has tremendously blessed me since I've been back, I sit and read my Bible, and the other day I was reading, and I'm, I, I don't know, about halfway through the chronological Bible. I'm in Kings and Chronicles and all that stuff. And there was some mention made of the, the festival, the feast days. And I got thinking, I'm wondering if some of those Jews back then, in, in Paul's day, they go to Jerusalem for their festival. I'm wondering if they said, you know what, this is where Jesus walked. This is where Jesus walked. I wonder if they got the same kind of thrill that a couple of Georgia guys would get uh, 2,000 years later. I'm not real sure if they did. But I know one thing. Two of us got a blessing and a half just out of that. Oh, there's four. Okay, there's a couple more down here. <laughs> well, anyway. Well, you guys are the professionals. You're the pioneers. So I, we didn't count you all this time. But I, the map up here, the top of the mountain, the north end of Israel, Mount Hermon. There's, there's, the spring area there is called Banyas. And I hate some of this stuff that we saw over there because it's, it's kind of pagan and it's kind of Catholic and that sort of thing. But where the mountain is and where the river starts, Banyas is a place where they used to worship the pagan god Pan, P-A-N. And originally that little area was called Panaeus. And the folks that conquered the land after Panaeus worshipers were there they conquered the land, and they had some sort of a little speech problem, and they couldn't say P words very good. And so they changed it from Panaeus to Banyas, B-A-N-I-S, just because they could say that word. <clears throat> little things like that. I don't know why that sticks in my mind, why I can remember that and can't memorize a Bible verse. But anyway, <clears throat> the truth of the matter is, there we were at the beginning of the Jordan River. We left there and headed south. I'm lying to you. Let, let me tell you the, the real story. Ricky told you the way we actually started. We started at the Dead Sea, and we kind of wandered and meandered back and forth across. We headed north mostly. I'm telling you we're going south because that's the way the river runs, okay? We're going to pretend tonight that we actually started there. We were there, okay? But we're going to pretend we started there and then came down south, okay? That's where if I say we went south, Y'all just, you know, take it with a grain of salt. We probably didn't go south at that, that leg of the thing. But it's as if we're following the Jordan. That's what I want to do tonight for just a very few minutes is uh, follow Jordan. Uh, let's see. Sea of Galilee was next. He told you about Sea of Galilee. He told you a couple things about us riding on that boat and going down to where the old boat was. Let me tell you a little bit about the Sea of Galilee. <clears throat> it is small. It's a lake. 13 miles long about seven to seven and a half miles wide. We got bigger lakes in Georgia, okay? But we don't have any just like that because that one Jesus walked on. That's the one that Jesus in the storm said, peace, be still, and the waves just laid down like little puppies at his feet, okay? That's a special lake, a special sea. And if you read your New Testament carefully, you find that Jesus was in Nazareth as a boy. And when he started his ministry, let's just say they didn't receive him well. Okay? They wouldn't accept him as Savior. They uh, wanted to kill him. And so he said, uh, you know what, I think I'm going to move. And he moved from Nazareth to Capernaum. And you saw in one of the pictures up here, it said, Capernaum, the city of Jesus. Capar is a village. And so Capernaum is really the village of Nahum. And it's not the prophet Nahum. It's probably a wealthy guy. But it was a village named after a guy named Nahum. And Jesus moved there to live. And he was there at least two years, maybe a little bit more. And much of his ministry centered around Capernaum. And Capernaum's right on the shore of Galilee. And so his ministry was in the city of Capernaum and up and down that coast on the uh, what would be the west side of, of the Sea of Galilee. Half of his parables were delivered on the shoreline of Galilee. 
most of his big miracles were performed either in the city of Capernaum or right around on the Sea of Galilee. His two biggest miracles, I think, around Galilee was walking on the water and still in the storm. But you just can't get a hold of the feeling. I told you I was going to talk about feelings and about what, what, it, what it does to you. A boat ride is a boat ride. That's it. Until you get on a boat on the Sea of Galilee and you're riding in that boat, and you got some tour guide tossing nets out, talking about maybe we'll fish on the other side and get 153 fish. You say, that sounds biblical, doesn't it? You know? And you realize that Jesus Christ, our Savior, rode in boats on that very sea. They, uh, they tell us that the storms still come. In the afternoons in the spring and summertime, that if the wind is going just exactly right, I think it has to come from the east and it kicks up big storms. If it comes from the west, it, maybe it, it's one way or the other. I can't remember which. But they still have storms on the Sea of Galilee. said maybe not as, as critical and as severe as they were, were in Bible times, but they still have waves kicking up over there and you can get the idea that, you know what, in a little boat, that boat he's talking about, that 2,000-year-old boat, 25 feet long, about seven and a half feet wide, and that was their mode of transportation. They said on one of those little boats, there was a helmsman, somebody to tell them what to row and how to row and what to turn. They had four people rowing, and they had a seating for about 15 people in a 25-foot boat. Can you imagine? It wouldn't take much of a, uh, of a ripple in the sea to make people nervous. <laughs> We watched that boat and looked at that boat and just stood there in awe that anybody would take his 12 disciples and get in some little, uh, little skiff like that and go across a seven and a half mile wide lake with any possibility of a storm coming. But our Savior did that. Okay. I was glad to be on the Sea of Galilee. Well, Ricky told you about Tiberius. That's where the 2,000-year-old the, the boat was found. I'm not going to say much about that. I will say this. If you ever get a chance to, to look up the Jesus boat in YouTube, I'm sure they've got it by now on record there. Look at how they had to bring that thing up out of the mud. I think it was 70,000 cubic feet of, uh, of polyurethane stuff that they had to... That they had to blow up under the thing and on top of the thing so that it was completely solid. And once they had it completely encased in this polyurethane foam kind of stuff, then they could lift it up with some kind of a crane doohickey and move it into the place. They said it took seven years once they got it up and out of the, out of the dirt. They soaked it and, and put chemicals to it and everything, but it took seven years to make it possible for it to be out in the open air in a museum setting so that it wouldn't just disintegrate. A lot of interesting stuff. Uh, <clears throat> let's see. Do, 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 do. Okay. Heading down south some more now. We weren't really, but I'm, you're forgiving me for telling you a lie. Headed down south, down Highway 90, we passed Jericho on the right-hand side. When we passed Jericho, wow, the Jordan must be close here because they had to cross the Jordan to get into Jericho. We'll give you a little something about Jordan. We think of the Jordan River, you know. Oh, they came and they couldn't cross. It's, it's too wide. It's too rough where there's no way we can get across here. And God had to perform a miracle. Do you remember reading that? We get the idea of this Jordan being like the mighty Mississippi, you know, coming down the line and just huge river and all that stuff. Most of the cases... Wherever you find the Jordan River, it's about 50 feet wide. A couple times a year during flash flood time, overflow, and it may wind up being a half mile wide. That still ain't much of a river for us, is it? I mean, we're in Georgia, and we got bigger rivers than that, but we don't have any rivers that are any more significant than the Jordan River. From Banyas all the way down to the what do you call it, the Sea of Galilee, and then the Jordan River picks up again at the bottom of the sea and goes down to the Dead Sea. Roughly 100 miles is the length of the Jordan River. But if you, if you, if you wind around like this, 
it's at least double that, okay, because it's a meandering kind of a little river that heads down there. And uh, so it doubles at least in length just because it's not a straight shot. But that little 100 mile or 200 miles, if you count all the curves, that little river, not very wide, not very deep, that river is the most significant river in the Holy Land. And by the way, I believe it's the most significant river anywhere. My Savior was baptized in that river in obedience to his Father. Okay? That river, and another little thing, Oh, Jericho, there's Jordan River, and you had to cross to get in here. Uh, Jesus was baptized somewhere around here. What, well, 40 miles from there he was. Okay? Everything that happens in the Jordan River, because we're people like we are, we read a book, and we've got the location, Jordan River. Not everything that happened on the Jordan River happened at the same place. Some of it was in the north. Some of it was above the Sea of Galilee. Some of it was between the Sea of Galilee and the Dead Sea. There's a long river and a lot of activity. Thank God that we have the record of it and we can read it and, and rejoice in things that happen. God stopped the river so his people could cross into the promised land, into Jericho. Thank God for that. Somebody said, well, it was just a little river, and you just said it was a little river. It didn't take much. It took the hand of God to stop it, I can tell you that such that they could walk on dry ground from this side of the Jordan to that side of the Jordan and just, just in eyesight to go and then whip the Jericho folks and see those walls come crashing down almost on the shore of the Jordan River. We're halfway home, folks. We're headed south, and we just passed Jericho. By the way, Jericho wasn't on our, on our itinerary. I can't remember exactly where it was, but it was shortly after we left Banyas and had drunk that cool water. The guide said, now coming up ahead, we're going to cross a bridge. This is the Jordan River. Now I got my camera out. I'm going to see the real river now, not just the spring, not just the little pool, not just the little uh, cup of, of cold water. Boy, we crossed the Jordan River. It wasn't much more than a ditch at that place. It was about 10, 15 feet wide. Little old bridge, one of those, and you're over it, that kind of thing. No big skyscraping bridge, no big huge river, just a little. And, the, and it wasn't very pretty at that place either. It was kind of green, yucky water, okay? But you know what, folks? It was just as big a thrill to say I crossed the Jordan River in a bus and was able to snap a picture out the side. Israel is a small country. There's nothing big about it except its history, its legacy. The thing big about Jordan is who was there and what he did while he was there. Our Savior, the Lord Jesus, followed in baptism. Thank God, Brother Ricky, your son right there, BJ, is going to get baptized. What does that mean? Get him any more saved? Absolutely not. He's following in obedience to the Lord. Had the privilege, Brother Ricky mentioned this, while we were there, of being able to baptize some folks, rebaptize some folks. And again, I, we, we had a lot of opportunity to speak up if we wanted to. So I said, oh, yeah, I'd be glad to baptize for you. Oh, yeah. Let me preach about a 10-minute message here on what baptism stands for. And there were some of those little ladies that I, I, I'm sure they'd never heard the story of baptism by immersion and what it meant and why it was there. They, uh, they, they were expecting some sprinkling, I guess. I'm not real sure, but I, I don't do sprinkling but had the opportunity to preach about grace. And I told them, let me give you some instruction about being baptized. I said, I don't need your help baptizing you. I want you to come down there completely trusting me, just like getting saved. When you get in the water with me, don't grab onto my arm, don't grab onto my wrist, don't hold your nose, I'll take care of you. What I want you to do is get in the water and cross your arms and trust me. I've not lost one yet. Don't plan on losing one today. I said, when you get in there with me, if you will, just, just loosen your knees a little bit so I can get you all the way down and all the way back. Okay. The last guy I baptized was about 6'4". Great big guy like this. I said, you really been your knees. I still had to take a sideways <laughs> step. To, to get. 
We baptized 18 people, and it was after the baptism, we were in some little gift shop. They're trying to sell us some stuff, and one of the women came to me and said, you know what? This was kind of a blessing. I've never been baptized before. I've been saved for a long time, but I've never been baptized before. I said, you have now. Oh, yeah, you've been baptized now. She said, well, I just can't wait to get back to church. I said, be sure that you tell them why you got baptized and what it really means and be sure that you incorporate that into your testimony that you were saved and now you're baptized. Okay? We had a lot of good times in Israel, really did. All right. I see you looking at your watch. We're not in a hurry. All right. It's when he shakes it like that that it bothers me. <laughs> anyway. All right, let's go. Let's see. How far do we go? Da -da -da -da. Masada. He's already told you a little bit about Masada. Let me tell you another thing or two. If you were watching this thing here just a few minutes ago, there was a model of Masada. I don't even want to call it a hill. I'll call it a mountain. <clears throat> it's huge. On one side of Masada, it's, it's kind of a round, uh, straight up, flat top, cliff kind of a mountain. On one side, it's 300 feet tall. And that's just because the land is kind of like this, and then here comes Masada. Okay, it's on a slope. On this side, it's about 300 feet tall. On this side, it's 1,000 feet tall. And this palace was built by Herod the Great. And he built it because he's a little bit paranoid. He was always afraid somebody's going to come attack my country. I need somewhere to hide. I need somewhere to hide my family. And so he built these two palaces up on the top of this thing, one palace on the very top, and he said, you know, nah, nah, that's not enough. I need more. And so they chopped out a big chunk of the mountain down below that level. They just cut out, and I don't, I don't know how many square feet or cubic feet, just unreal amount of dirt and rock that would have had to have been chopped out of the side of this thing. And then he said, let's build us some more. And he built the, uh, the part down here was for his family, especially the ladies in the family. Nice, nice stuff. Glorious thing. And he said, you know what? We need another level. So they put another level, a third level down here. And I believe that was for the, uh, for the view, they said. And so that the prince, princess could get out of her bed and walk out there and take a look at the glory of the land and all that stuff. They had a years-long project building this thing in three stages. And they told the story of 966 Jewish zealots that were, were sick of being slaves to Rome. And they said, we'll go up on that mountain and we'll live there and worship there. We'll do everything we need to do and we'll be separate from Rome. And they were up there for a couple of years. And then Rome, I, I don't know if they got wind of it or they just got mad. I'm not real sure what, what prompted it. But the Romans said, we're going to go get them now. We're going to bring them down out of that thing. And I'm not going to tell you the whole story, but what a story it is. By the way, since I've got back, I've already ordered two books. I ordered The Source by James Michener. I bought a book by uh, Flavius Josephus, the historian, The Jewish Wars. And I'm going to get the movie Masada with Peter O'Toole, a four-hour-long movie, she said. She said it's pretty close to to what Josephus wrote. Okay. I've got another set of books I need to get by some woman named Regan something or other that talks about Orthodox Jewry and, and the, the, the people that dress funny. And that woman that we had for a guide, she had some nerve about her. We're standing by the Wailing Wall, by the Western Wall. And these people go by, and the, and the Jewish guys really look kind of funny. They've got those little curly hair things that hang down to about here. They got funny hats on them. They got uh, britches that they must have got on discount because they only come to about here. And then they got black socks and they come and long old coats. And she said, I, she said, I'm a Jew and I don't know why they do that. She said, the only thing I can figure is they want to make their, their men uh, so ugly that uh, no Gentile woman will look at them. And so she said, uh, they'll never get a good looking woman this way. And so they, they dress up, the, and they started at about this age. They dress them up funny. She said, that's about all I can figure out. She said, why do they do it? I don't know. Look at that guy walking there. Is that not weird? <laughs> we had a good time. <clears throat> let, me, let me finish up Masada. 
those 966 men, women, boys, and girls up on top of that mountain had plenty of food, plenty of water. The, the place was built that it would withstand a siege for years. And there they were in that place. And at the end, when it came, they just could not win. They understood, we are going to die tomorrow. First day, here comes that battering ram he talked about. They, they knocked down a portion of the wall. The second day, <clears throat> the Jews stayed up all night long and took beams out of all the buildings and re-closed re up that door. And then they came and they set fire to the thing. They, they were going to get in. And the fellow that was in charge said to the people inside on that night, we've gone as far as we can go. There's nothing more we can do. We're going to fall tomorrow. When the soldiers come, we're not able to defend ourselves. And here's the decision they made. And they made it as a group, 966 of them, said we will not be slaves ever again. Our children will not know slavery ever again. So they made a pact that they would die by their own weapons. And they killed themselves. They chose lots. They took uh, cast lots, and they had ten men that were to, to be the, the finishers off, I guess you'd say. And the heads of house were responsible for taking out their wives and their children. And then these ten men were charged to take the, the daddies out. And then as the ten were left, they chose one, this leader, and they said, we will kill each other, and then the last one, you kill, and then you fall on your own sword. And this leader said, we will not. And by the way, I can't prove that, okay, that's just what our guide told us and what Flavius Josephus wrote, okay, there's still some controversy about that, I'm not going to get into that, it's a tremendous good story, so I'm going to tell it, okay, these 966 died, the leader had said, we will burn everything up here, except the food, we want them to see that we got plenty of food, the cisterns are full of water, we want to leave that behind. We want to leave the weapons so that they see we were able to defend ourselves. We were not going to be starved. We were not going to run out of water. But we made a valid, conscious decision that death would be better than slavery to the Romans. I'd like to make a little application, just a little one, and then we'll move on. Let me ask you a question. Did you guess it would be more important for us to say, I will not be a slave or a servant to sin. If I have to die, I will not allow me and my family to be slaves to sin. They said physical slavery is bad enough that we'd rather die. Let me ask the question. Where would you place freedom and liberty and victory over sin, where would you place that on your, your, uh, your importance gauge, if you will? If it's a way down here and ah, a little sin won't hurt, okay, I'll guarantee you a little sin will hurt. And it'll hurt more as it grows. It'll hurt you and it'll hurt your family. These folks said, we will die rather than be slaves. What a thing. Let me tell you about a guy named Moshe Diane. Does anybody know who Moshe Diane was? He was the he was the director of the Israel Defense Foundation or whatever. Tremendous big general, big time hero in the Israeli army. Moshe Diane, while he was in uh, in power, I guess, had a ceremony that folks that went through basic training for this IDF, and that's not just like Private Jones, okay? This, this is like, a, a higher, like special forces. When these guys graduated and finished their, their basic training, Moshe Diane said, we're going to make them walk up the snake path up the backside of Masada. They're going to get inside the ruins of Masada, and they're going to take their vows, and they're going to be commissioned, if you will. They did it at night by torchlight up this long path up that thousand foot hill, cliff, mountain. 
And once they got in, they were awarded their certificates and that kind of stuff. And their vow that they made, every one of those guys that graduated, their, their battle cry, if you will, Masada will not fall again. It's kind of like us saying, remember the Alamo, that kind of thing. They took their charge from men and women, boys and girls that had died 2,000 years ago, well, 1,900 years ago at that time. They took their courage and their strength and their resolve from folks that had lived 1,900 years and said, we will not be slaves ever again. And these young men said, we will not allow our people to be slaves again. Masada will not fall again. That was another one of those kind of choke up kind of things when I heard that kind of a story. It may be 100% true. It may be 50% true. Nobody was inside that thing except five, five children and two women, I believe, and they got out and told the story to Josephus, and he recorded it. A lot of controversy as to whether it's true. For me, it's true, and for me, it's inspiring, and for me, I'd like to say, I will not be slave to sin. I'd rather die than to recant my faith in Christ or to become weak and, and powerless in my Christian walk. Okay. I'd encourage you to make a a similar thought that way. Let me see. I think we're about done. Um, I think I am done. I'm going to just quit. Almost quit. Don't, 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 don't get excited. <laughs> this is just like Brother Melvin says, well, I will let my people go. Oh, yeah. In closing, four in closings later, he's finally said, now let's bow and take an invitation. I'm almost closing. This is almost the real thing. Let me say to you, if you ever have opportunity to go, go. Whatever the, whatever, the, whatever the hardship it might cause, if you have opportunity to go, you should go. I'll promise you this. If you're anything at all like this boy right here, you will never be the same again. I've, already, I've only been back a week, not even a week yet. And already, I can't read my Bible like I used to. It's not the same. I look now, and I say, oh, my goodness, what a blessing. I've always loved my Bible. Y'all know that. I, I teach Sunday school, teach Monday night. I, I'm, I'm thrilled with my book. It's wonderful. But it has taken on such life and such vitality in those eight days, wandering up and down and back and forth across the land of Israel, that I can honestly say I'll never read my Bible the same way that I did in the past. I can honestly say that I'll never be the same man that I was in the past. Why? Did you get saved? You know, I was saved before I got there. Didn't even get rebaptized. okay? I went over there saved and I came back saved. But I came back with a heart so slammed full of Jesus, my Heavenly Father, and the, the action that has been in the past that my Savior has done for me. And I was able to see and walk and touch some things that Jesus would have had his hand on very possibly. My feet went in sometimes where his feet were. And every time we had an opportunity when, when, they, would, when they would say something like, now this is where Jesus walked. We had to... <laughs> We had to go inside of a Catholic church now and look down through a glass plate to see Nazareth and to see where they believe Mary was raised. I didn't care about Mary's house. You know, okay, she lived in a house, that's fine. But what we did see was some cobblestones. And if it was Mary's house, that's wonderful. And if it wasn't Mary's house, guess what? Nazareth was such a small little town that Jesus could have still walked on those cobblestones. And to see those smooth, round, gray, and brown cobblestones and look at them down through that glass thing and stop and just think, my Savior, as a boy, may have walked right there. I don't know what they played with. I don't know what kind of toys they had. We, we used to have <laughs> stick toys. I don't know if Jesus had one of those broom horses, you know, you're riding. Yeah, yeah. I don't know if he had that. But that little cobblestone 
street right there. And it, it was just, I don't know, 100 square feet maybe. My Savior walked there as a boy. Then we saw those stairs where I was personally able to put my feet on the stairs outside the judgment hall going down. Not the judgment hall. Did I say judgment hall? I meant the Last Supper. After the Last Supper is when he went to Gethsemane, not after judgment. What's wrong with me? But, but just think about it. My feet were where his feet were when he was headed to Gethsemane. Amazing. Absolutely amazing. He's walked the streets of Nazareth. He's walked the streets of Bethlehem. He's walked the streets of uh, Capernaum. He's walked the streets of Jerusalem. I'd like to say to you tonight, he's walked the streets of my heart. If you're saved, if you're saved, he's walking the streets in your heart. And he wants to be to you all and more than what he is to me and Ricky Ferguson tonight. Our Savior loves every one of us and has paid the price. And it, I'm just a... Somebody gave me a T-shirt that said, Ask me about Israel. If I ever wear that shirt, don't you dare, okay? Because <clears throat> if we got plenty of time, it'd be worse than this. I'm going to say this. My daughter is in the process of putting together a scrapbook for me, not a scrapbook, of an album of some kind with pictures and notes and scripture and all that kind of stuff. I'm thinking it'll probably be a month before. But anyway, when I get that done, and you see me coming, I've got my King James Bible in one hand, and I've got this big thing under my arm. I, would, I wouldn't say, oh, Brother Joe, what's that book all about there, buddy? Don't do it, okay, unless you've got a lot of time. <laughs> Brother Melvin, I'm done. God bless you all. Thank you again for your prayers, and thank you for welcoming us back home.